We're going to let the uh, speaker settle in, and I'll do a very quick introduction. Uh, my name is Mike Purcell. I'm the, I manage operations for Center on Global Interest. Uh, we're really excited about today, uh, but in the same way, we're sort of, um, this is nothing to celebrate. Uh, if anybody's watched the classic of American theater, uh, or cinema rather, called uh, Heartbreak Ridge, Clint Eastwood's in it, and he uh, has a line in there where he's arguing with the commanding officer who's threatening to punish him, and he says, you can beat me, you can run me, you can work me, just don't bore me. And uh, those of us that are involved in, in studying this part of the world or have an interest in seeing sort of mutually benefit, beneficent uh, relationships develop, uh, we, we are uh, not bored, if anything. So um, with that, uh, I would tell you that CGI, there's going to standard caveat, we don't have a position, we're interested in promoting dialogue uh, and allowing these folks to educate us uh, collectively. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Anya Shenman from uh, CFR and uh, let her introduce the speakers and, and get going. Thank you. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone, and welcome. And thank you for joining us for this discussion today about a very uh, timely issue uh, that is causing some concern, that is Turkey-Russia uh, relations and consequences for the region. Um, and I'm very pleased to be joined by some terrific experts today. So uh, as we all know, um, relations between Moscow and Ankara have deteriorated sharply since Turkey shot down a Russian fighter bomber near the Syrian-Turkish border on November 24. Uh, the downing of the jet has damaged ties between these two key countries and has raised questions about their involvement in the Syria conflict. Uh, in fact, a meeting between uh, Russian President Putin and Turkish President Erdogan had been uh, scheduled for today, uh, did not happen, um, and it does not seem that the friction will go away anytime soon. So to discuss these tensions and consequences for the military operation in Syria, and also implications for the Caucasus nations. Um, I'm joined by three panelists today who will discuss Turkey, Russia, and the consequences. They'll each give short opening remarks, and then I'll have a conversation with them, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Kemal uh, Kirishchi <laughs> from the Brookings Institution. Uh, let me just get your bio here. Kamal is the Tusaid Senior Fellow and Director of the Center on United States and Europe's Turkey Project at Brookings, uh, where he runs the Turkey Project Policy Paper Series and writes about Turkey. Primary, uh, prior to joining Brookings, he was a professor uh, in Istanbul, and his uh, recent publications uh, include books about Syria, Turkey, and the Caucasus. Uh, so, uh, Kamal, we turn it over to you for some. <laughs> Just some short opening remarks, and then we'll have a conversation afterwards. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> many, many thanks uh, for the introductions, as well as for the invitation to share my thoughts with you on uh, this worrisome uh, to uh, topic. Uh, the organizers asked me to focus on two questions. One, Turkey's motivations in Syria and the region more broadly and secondly, where Turkey-Russia relationship might be headed uh, for in uh, 2016. Time is very limited. There's a lot that I'd like to sh uh, share with you, discuss with you, but let me uh, address the first uh, topic here. I think we can speak of two Turkeys uh, when it comes to foreign policy. One Turkey is what I call a Turkey's for a Turkey whose foreign policy was until a few years ago driven but what I call a trading state interests and considerations. And then there is a second Turkey that, uh, that became more and more prominent from roughly the emergence of the Arab Spring and the years that have uh, followed. This is a Turkey that uh, the current prime minister referred to as a central power a power that can shape uh, its neighborhood and influence uh, the events and outcomes in that uh, neighborhood. The first one explains the extent to which Turkey's economic relationship with not just Russia, but also the neighborhood expanded, including Syria, a very intimate, close relationship with, uh, with uh, Syria. The second is more a function of the Arab Spring. We can't go into the details of it, but the Turkish leadership 
perceived an opportunity to implement this notion of a central, central power. The initial belief was that uh, the regime in uh, the regime in Damascus was not going to last very long. This is why an open door policy was adopted for uh, the uh, refugees. But the reality turned out to be a very different one. And today we have a Turkey <coughs> that is implicated in uh, the Syrian conflict as much as some of the other major uh, uh, players. And this is the point at which I think Russian and Turkish relations began to, to head for a major con uh, confront uh, confrontation. Why very briefly? Because for Turkey, uh, to, to put it very crudely in street language, enemy number one is Assad, followed by the Kurdish challenge in uh, northern Syria. We can go into the details of it. And only and only then does the Islamic State constitute uh, a threat or enemy uh, status, uh, status there. And it, whereas Russia the, uh, the priorities are completely different there. It's against that background that I think the downing of the jet needs to be uh, appre uh, appreciated or understood. The second question, where the Turkey-Russia relationship might be in, uh, in the next year, well, put it, Putin has put it quite starkly, the downing of the jet. It's a stab in the back. I think the choice of those words says a lot about Turkish-Russian relations at the time. I would call it as a very intimate but extremely complicated uh, re relationship. The intimacy is very much driven by this economic interdependence. I really wish there was time and we could go into the details of it for me to show you the degree of uh, the intimacy but also highlight that when it comes to trade, Turkish exports this year in the first nine months of 2015 to the United States was <coughs> almost twice the size to Russia. Okay. So trade-wise, we need to make put things into some perspective, whereas Turkey imports a good chunk of its energy from Russia. It depends heavily on Russia. It imports a good chunk of its wheat and grain from uh, Russia. The imbalance in trade is made up for two things that doesn't exist in US-Turkish relations. One, Russia, and that's where the intimacy comes, has allowed Turkish companies to operate in uh, uh, Russia extensively there are figures I can throw at you, but today, 15, roughly 15% 15 of beer that is consumed in Russia is brewed by a Turkish company, and its shares have been coming down, not surprisingly. Pitifully, my old man, late father, left me with a lot of those shares that are lose, fast losing uh, va va value there. Secondly, Russian tourism to, uh, to Turkey has been very significant. Last year, it had reached its peak in spite of Russian economic uh, problems. 4.4 million, somewhere around there, 3 million, compared to about 200, 250,000 Americans visiting Turkey. My last, uh, uh, and this, this tiff, if you wish, between Turkey and Russia is having an impact on Russia economically as well as on Turkey. Two scenarios for the, fu uh, for the future. Uh, my sense, I was briefly discussing this with Michael, is that the two sides, in spite of the rhetorics, especially the rhetorics coming from the Russian side, are trying to keep the lid on, uh, on this uh, tiff and try to prevent it from escalating. I heard the Russian Economic Development Minister in Brussels earlier in the month saying that these sa sanctions are temporary and the sanctions uh, space is somewhat uh, li uh, li limited. By hitting, by hitting 
uh, Turkish economy, in some ways, I think Putin is trying to hurt Turkey from its Achilles tendon. But I, am, I can't help but wonder at the same time if the problem continues, the conflict continues, whether we are not facing a situation somewhat, not completely, somewhat similar to what Joseph Stalin did in April 1945 when he, demand, he made territorial demands on Turkey, pushing Turkey straight into the arms, the laps, and embrace of, uh, of the West. The difference between the Turkey of the time and today is that Turkey, unlike Russia, unlike Iran, has to have an economy. And one of the ways of having an economy is to trade and uh, its trade and its economic relationship with the whole neighborhood is collapsing, or it has collapsed. Iraq is an important partner, and now there is possibility that Turkey may also be losing the Iraqi market. That leaves, economically and security-wise, one, one address left for Turkey to go back and attempt to repair its relations with the West, which has already started to uh, take place. Is this what Putin had been aiming to do, is the question mark with which I stop my remarks here. Wonderful. Thank you, Kemal. Thank you very much. Turkey is certainly at a very uh, interesting point uh, right now, uh, both in regard to Russia and Syria, but also its own domestic politics, its uh, activities in Iraq, which have uh, kind of boiled to a head this week. Um, and in fact, just yesterday, the European Union also uh, restarted talks on uh, EU integration. So a very interesting moment, and we'll get into some yes. of that in the Q&A. Uh, next, we will hear more about the uh, Russian perspective, and I would like to introduce uh, Maria Snegovaya, who is uh, a PhD candidate uh, at Columbia University, and it's uh, good to have you here in Washington, um, where she studies uh, populist parties in Eastern Europe. She also writes uh, several columns and is a frequent commentator uh, on these issues. Uh, Maria, tell us a little bit about the Russian side, please. Yes, dear O, it's a big honor for me to uh, be discussing these issues with you tomorrow. So, because I have very limited time, I just wanted to very briefly cover three main questions of interest with regards to Russia's position in this uh, Turkey, Russia-Turkey conflict. Uh, so first of all, why, uh, why was Russia actually doing, why was Russia actually purpose creating this situation that led to the escalation, right? Why, why was Russia sending the jets uh, that actually violated the Turkish um, air airspace? Uh, second question would be, was Putin really expecting uh, to the similar kind of situation to happen, or did it have to take him by surprise, right? And the third and the most, of course, important question would be, what are we to expect now that we are uh, in the situation? Where is this going to go, uh, right? First of all, uh, immediately after the uh, uh, incident has happened, immediately after Turkey has downed the Russian jet, uh, Russian officials have been uh, saying repeatedly that it was just an incident. The fact that uh, the, uh, the Turkish uh, airspace is violated by the Turkish, uh, by the Russian jet. In fact, that is not true, and that is something we know for sure, right? Russia has been consecutively implementing similar kind of uh, actions with many NATO members and violating international space as well, at least in the last two years. In November 2014, the European Leadership Network documented at least 39 similar incidents by the Russian side in the last eight months. And the same uh, incidents continued in 2015, mostly with the Baltic states, right? So Russia has been doing that not only with Turkey alone, and Russia was doing that obviously with certain kind of purpose in mind, right? What kind of purpose can that be? The, the first obvious answer is, of course, Russia is right now trying to reposition itself as a powerful player on the geopolitical um, uh, stage. So from this perspective, it's, uh, what it is doing is definitely trying to test the NATO resilience and trying to basically see how is NATO to react to this kind of violations, to this kind of uh, conflict situation that as it has been creating, right? And it's important to point out that to some extent, it has been achieving what it really wants because uh, not reacting to this consecutive incidents of the violating of the international borders, of the certain borders of the NATO member countries is a weakness on the NATO side. So that has been working 
consecutively for the last two, two years until it wasn't, right? As we see in the Turkey case, and that something, in my opinion, that Russia did not expect. Second uh, goal is that definitely when Russia entered the Syrian conflict, it was understood in the Russian part that the goals of uh, President Erdogan and the Turkish government are strictly opposed to the Russian interests in this conflict. And from this perspective, you know, also slight violation of the borders, this kind of incidents were there just to uh, kind of, uh, you know, ref reflect this muscle place that Vladimir Putin, the pre president of Russia, really likes doing. That would be kind of showing to Turkey who is the real master, who is the real uh, decision maker in this game. Uh, that, that's as we talk about the strategic level. But there's also the tactic, uh, tactical level of uh, the conflict. And one of uh, the reasons why Russia might have been um, doing what it was doing um, uh, has to do with the first stolen Turkish plans to create safe zones in Syria. Right. I hope we can talk a little bit more about that. But in general, this has been a, an idea on the Turkish side, which kind of has to, uh, would have potentially helped to soften the conflict, uh, to create these zones in Syria in which refugees and militants um, uh, belonging to the acceptable Sunni opposition to Assad, those groups would be held uh, in political settlements in Syria. And Turkey has been advocated that uh, for a while. Now, with the uh, Russian jets actually consecutively flying to those areas and bombing those uh, opposition groups is actually something that was not going to happen. And that was one of the reasons why the Russian jets were actually in this, present in those areas. Uh, one more reason is that Russia is really interested uh, from the beginning, from the onset of its Syria campaign, to keep the Latakia province under its control, because you probably know that Latakia is the a place where an important naval uh, facility, Tartars facility, is, is located, and Russia has been trying to keep, to keep it. And the way to do it is, was also to attack the Turkmen militias of northern Latakia province. Those were, again, uh, the groups that Turkey has been supporting. So again, uh, the same kind of jets uh, would be um, destroying those militias. And finally, of course, those actions would have led, would have led to by, um, ideally, uh, from the Russian perspective, to panic on the side of the Turk Turkmen population and would uh, escalate the immigration crisis, make them move uh, to Turkey faster. So those might have been the reasons why the Russian jet was actually present, where it was present, right? Now, did uh, Putin, did the Kremlin really expect Turkey to react the way it did, right? So here the opinions of the analysts uh, actually uh, diverge. But uh, in my position, what sh the way we saw the kind of reaction that came from the Russian side immediately after the uh, uh, downing of the jet has occurred suggests that no. And uh, using Putin's uh, words himself, it was actually a knife in the back. That was something that Russia did not expect to happen, right? At least, why, why would it expect it, uh, somebody to down the jet if, once again, we've been observing sem similar incidents for the last two years already, and nobody dared to provide this kind of ne negative feedback to this kind of Russian actions, right? This has been unexpected, and the initial Im reaction that we have received from the side of the Russian officials has also been quite emotional, right? This knife in the back and uh, multiple threats coming from the Russian officials. And by the way, quite an erratic number of suggestions uh, regarding of how Turkey must be punished for its misbehavior, right? So the current assumptions that I play in place are tough on Turkey, but they are far less tough than was actually initially promised on the Russian side, and that's something I wanted to emphasize, right? So Russia is kind of responding, but it does not it respond to the maximum extent. It might have if it really wanted to kind of do something completely horrible and detrimental, it, w it could uh, have done it. And we have seen these threats stemming from the Russian side initially. Now, Russia has not also been interested in escalating uh, the relationship with Turkey to such an extent because Turkey controls the Bosphorus, right? And that's a really important strategic um, uh, place for Russia to have an access to. So what we've been observing in the last uh, uh, period in the last weeks, it's not what Russia needs from the perspective of its engagement in the Syria conflict. Uh, then again, one of the obvious and quite often stated 
purposes of Russia's engagement in the Syria conflict has been the re-establishment of its relationship with the West, with the United States primarily, but also with the West, right? We know, of course, that the uh, 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 Russia's uh, uh, international relations with uh, the Western countries has stalled, uh, has been um, put on halt following its Crimea uh, and uh, Ukraine uh, campaign. And since then, uh, Syria was one of the ways for Russia to reintegrate itself in the world stage and to reignite its relationships with the West. And actually, we can discuss again that a little bit later, but in general, what Russia has been doing so far in Syria did result in certain kind of progress. Russia did kind of reestablish itself as a player. We see the United States officials, high-level officials, to actively trying to contact Russia, trying to get in touch. We see a lot of interest on the side of the Western European countries uh, supporting Russia's engagement in the Syria conflict. We definitely see that Russia is back as a world play on this stage. And from that perspective, uh, this kind of incident that actually created clear escalation with one of the countries who is a NATO member was not in the interests of Russia, right? So that is just to emphasize that, again, that is something Russia did not uh, plan to happen. And finally, of course, there is this economic perspective. We know that uh, Turkey is Russia's number three, number five trade partner. Uh, the economic relationships are extremely important. And even though Russia has, of course, put in place its common instrument of sanctions, right? I mean, this is like the one and only approach it has been using always with every single country has been in conflict in the last decade. And there were quite a few of such ca uh, countries, as you know. Uh, nonetheless, it's also true that ca Russia can do that indefinitely. Uh, as bad as the economic situation Russia is right now, uh, you know, cutting it off, cutting itself off its key e economic partners, its key markets, is really, not, I'm sorry, it's really not the most uh, um, productive way to go. And also, don't forget that Turkey products actually substituted uh, on the Russian market have been substituting for all these other markets that Russia cut itself off previously, right? So when it cut off the products uh, from the Europe following the Ukrainian uh, conflict, while at least some of the products that came to replace them were from, the t from, tur from Turkish side, right? Now it's banning the Turkish products, right? So who is the one who will replace that, right? And when would Russia get in conflict with that next country, right? So this is the situation in which, this is the kind of escalation that you can't continue indefinitely. You gotta have to stop somewhere. Finally, having uh, uh, basically discussed this fact that Russia is really not that into the escalation with Turkey from my perspective, where is this taking us? What is going to, to happen next? Are we expecting for the Third World War to happen now, right? So from my perspective, like as bad as the situation is, it's not dramatic and not tragic. Russia is not uh, capable, and I think there's understanding at the high levels of Russia's leadership that it is not capable of running and uh, civil, severe military conflict on several in several er, in several countries, if it was to engage with uh, in the conflict in the serial uh, in a serious conflict with Turkey, uh, I would refer refer you to the very good article by Pavel Felgengar, Russian mil military analyst, who also shows that actually uh, it's not very unclear whether Russia has this uh, serious uh, military advantage over Turkey if this conflict was uh, to happen. Right now, we do observe, obviously, that the conflict is there, but it's more like a proxy war in Syria that Turkey and Russia has been fighting. Ideally, from the Russia's perspective, uh, for, the, for the Russian side would be to find certain kind of a symmetric response to downing of the Russian jet, so down a Turkish jet. But Turkey has been careful recently not to fly in Syria, not to create this opportunity for Russia to do the same. So that's why we see kind of smaller level reactions on the Russian side, such as attacking an unfortunate Turkish uh, fish fisherman boat that has happened recently, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we do also know that, uh, sorry, just with the last comment, we, knew, we do know that uh, the Russian leadership always cares a lot about its face. And there will definitely is a need on the Russian side to save the, f to save the face. So there will be certain kind of actions in the future designed to help it to save the face, uh, to face such a certain kind of retaliatory step designed to humiliate Ankara. But I don't think that we are really talking about serious uh, military conflict here. Thank you, Maria. So as uh, tensions rise between uh, Turkey and Russia, uh, hostilities are also 
uh, rising between their two allies in the Caucasus, Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, with shelling uh, in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. And to discuss implications for the Caucasus, we have our final speaker, Michael Sissery, who is uh, affiliated with the Foreign Policy Research Institute um, and is an analyst of the Black Sea and Eurasia region. He was formerly a visiting scholar at the Harriman Institute and has worked in Georgia. Uh, Michael, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll try to keep this brief uh, so we can get into the Q&A and uh, get into some of the, the details and the weeds of some of, some of these things. Um, I think the best place for me to start is that it may not have been uh, completely obvious um, before um, this SU-27 was shot down over Turkish airspace, uh, but in many respects, you could say that something like this was maybe not inevitable, but certainly um, within the realm of possibility, within the realm of, of distinct possibility at some point in the future. And the reason I say this is, although we're used to this narrative um, globally of Russia being a rising power and reasserting itself in its uh, so-called near abroad and uh, throughout Europe and other domains, it's also important to note that regionally, at least within uh, the Black Sea region and the Caucasus, you actually have the inverse of that. Uh, Russia is the traditional hegemon of the Caucasus region, of the Black Sea region, and Turkey has been regarded as kind of a rising power and uh, returning uh, to its, its previous state of, of strength in the region. Uh, so you actually have a, a very interesting dynamic where Turkey was uh, developing itself and uh, increasing its relationships um, throughout its own near abroad, uh, including in the Caucasus. And it was in this development uh, had it brush up against uh, the established Russian, uh, at least pretension to hegemony uh, in the Caucasus and Black Sea region. So there was bound to be at least some kind of tension. Um, a lot of it was actually happening well before this uh, SU-27 was shut down. It was uh, below the surface. It was more uh, kind of casual, quiet sniping. Um, behind, uh, on, on the sidelines of conferences and things like that, and maybe um, some statements here and there um, from, from both sides. But overall, both sides were, were content to play the, uh, uh, to preserve a, a, a strong relationship in the interest of economic, uh, economic cooperation. Uh, that's really changed in the Caucasus. Um, with this SU-27 going down in the Caucasus, you, you have um, a region that is roughly divided between the two, the two powers, and I'll go into that in a second. And w you also have w the makings of, of a tinderbox uh, for regional conflagrations that while I don't necessarily see a, um, a major uh, conflict erupting as a result of the downing of this jet, there's certainly a number of pressure points that, like the jet, it, like the jet incident itself, um, it only takes a spark to ignite. And that could lead to something, I think, quite a bit more dangerous. Regionally, uh, what you have in, in the South Caucasus, and uh, I'll speak a little bit more broadly in a second, is uh, you have three states with uh, almost, almost equally divided between the, the two powers. And I, I say that intentionally. I know you're not supposed to be able to divide three by two equally. But um, what you have in, in Armenia is essentially a, a client state of Russia. Um, Russian troops are garrisoned uh, in uh, several bases in Armenia. Um, actually, uh, recently uh, there's been there were Russian news reports that some 7,000 troops. I don't know if these are true, but it, it, this hasn't been confirmed yet. But there were Russian reports that 7,000 additional Russian troops uh, were going to be deployed to the Turkish border in Armenia. Um, and I we do know that uh, they just recently dispatched more attack helicopters to the Armenian border. So. What you have in Armenia is essentially a Russian aircraft carrier in the, in the South Caucasus. Uh, Georgia is essentially the converse of that in that uh, it is an aspiring NATO member, it is aspiring uh, to join um, Western institutions, and it is a very close uh, ally, a very close <coughs> partner with Turkey. And uh, I don't think that's any exaggeration uh, to say that because uh, when I speak with uh, Georgian officials, uh, of course, they're very congratulatory about their relationship with, their, with the West, and they want to integrate as deeply with the West as possible. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm frequently told, and you, you actually hear this in statements uh, quite a bit, that Turkey is our most important partner. And that's what the, the officials uh, in Georgia on, in multiple parties 
uh, will tell you. They will say Turkey on a day-to-day -day basis is our most important partner. Um, that's by dint of the fact that Turkey is uh, Georgia's <laughs> largest trading partner. Uh, they have, uh, Georgia is a key energy conduit to Turkey. Um, Turkey provides um, extensive security and, um, um, and economic aid to Georgia. And the two states um, are also cooperating on a number of other uh, political, defensive, um, and uh, economic programs. Um, one of which, the Baku-Tbilisi Cars Railway, is, looks to be uh, finishing up this year. So there's, there's a very close relationship between Georgia and Turkey. Um, Georgia does not have a defensive treaty with, with Turkey, but uh, Turkey has been a, a pretty uh, staunch advocate for Georgian entry into NATO. Uh, on the, now, you have these two very clear-cut cases in Armenia and Georgia, and then, then you have Azerbaijan, which um, if you follow Azerbaijan-Turkey relations, historically they are um, very, very close, uh, historically being post-1991, of course. Uh, they're very, very close. The, uh, the mantra is generally uh, uh, two states, one nation, um, in the sense that the Azerbaijani and Turkish people are, are one people um, divided by history and, and by dint of geography, but they are essentially a, a single beating heart, if you could put it that way. Um, but the, this, this incident has really um, exposed the cleavages uh, between Azerbaijan's relationships. Um, and since roughly uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, Euromaidan events, uh, the Azerbaijani regime has, uh, has taken its, uh, its policy towards a multi-vector relationship with Washington and, and, uh, and Russia and has actually uh, veered a little bit towards Russia um, more distinct, uh, distinctly. Uh, you could say, I think it, it's not a, a, an exaggeration to say that at this point, Azerbaijan is a, uh, a partner, a strategic partner, more so with Russia than uh, with the West. And, and that's not necessarily true of Turkey because Turkey is a large trading partner. It is uh, their cultural historic ties between the two. And the two states also have a, um, a mutual defense treaty like Russia has with Armenia. And this brings us to kind of the risks. Uh, the risks are, of course, that um, Turkey and, uh, and Russia will find another theater in which to compete. And there is already, that, that theater is already alive and well, in a sense, in, uh, along the line of, uh, line of control in, um, in Nagorno-Karabakh and, and the buffer regions and the um, um, Azerbaijani ter territory that's being occupied by Armenian forces. Uh, there's always the possibility that a, um, a spark along the, the line of control, there are thousands of troops massed on either side, and um, it, all it takes, as we've seen in the past, is uh, a, a small spark to ignite um, fresh rounds of fighting. Uh, but now with this added geopolitical context and this added contestation between Russia and Turkey, you have um, additional elements in which Russia may decide to, to use excuse me, may decide to use uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict as a means of, of uh, embarrassing uh, Turkey or its allies in some way or, uh, or the converse. And in the midst of this, Azerbaijan is torn between its own interest in preserving um, its, uh, its security and maintaining its, uh, its claims to Nagorno-Karabakh while also uh, continuing to keep its relations good with Russia, which it, uh, which it has uh, attached itself more firmly in recent years. So that's certainly one vector of, of, of risks. Um, the other one is, I would say, um, this Russian buildup in Armenia is certainly something to keep an eye on. It's not, I don't think it's any, in any way a, um, a precursor of some kind of, uh, you know, Ukraine-like event in Turkey, but it's certainly not a friendly act, and it's certainly one where um, just by the very nature of things, because of uh, the number of Russian forces at the border, um, and uh, the likelihood that Turkish forces are going to be on the other side monitoring them, that an incident is possible that could spark and spiral out of, uh, out of control. And of course, there's, uh, there's some other issues to consider as well. Armenia and Turkey, even though they're on opposite sides of this geopolitical divide, uh, have actually been trying over the last few years to mend their ties uh, and have been seeking out ways to um, engage in normalization. I mean, uh, right as we speak, there are people you know, who have these conversations right now to, to make this happen. Uh, Russia was against it before. 
they're definitely going to be against it now. And they're going to do everything they can uh, to ensure that Armenia does not open itself up to Turkey and by extension open itself up to the wider Western world. Uh, that, would, that would do great damage to uh, Russian influence in Armenia uh, and, and severely undermine its position regionally. So uh, it would be, it, it's very hard to see how a normalization can happen under the, under the present circumstances uh, without some kind of um, deus ex machina to, to shift things in, in one favor or another. Um, and, and the last thing I would say is also, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the North Caucasus and the, the wider, um, and also the Georgian separatist regions. These are regions, particularly Abkhazia, these are regions in which Russia has uh, obvious um, control in the form of troops and, um, and political, uh, uh, political control um, to a certain degree. Um, but at the same time, it would be a huge mistake for Russia to overestimate um, or rather to underestimate Turkish influence in these regions. Uh, Turkey has a large um, diaspora of Abkhaz in its, uh, in its country um, that is very active, and, is, and Turkey actually trades uh, relatively actively with Abkhazia, um, something that Tbilisi is not very happy about, but they kind of look the other way in the interest of, of it, their own relationship with Turkey. And uh, Turkey has been a source of uh, cultural and uh, economic, uh, cultural inspiration and economic uh, trade uh, for the North Caucasus region. I think uh, a really good point that Maria made, um, and also I think Kamal made this point as well, is the economic angle. In, Turkey has been a source of import substitution for Russia, but it, beyond that, it's also just the idea of losing Turkish goods means taking away um, a middle class lifestyle for a lot of Russians. And um, the effects of that. Uh, of the conflict with with Turkey, if uh, you don't have European goods, you don't have Turkish goods, and you're making and you're increasing the prices by uh, default of uh, consumer goods for um, ordinary Russians, I think that's going to have a major effect on um, the way they view things. Uh, I'll leave it there. We can take uh, you know get into it in the Q and A. But thank you, Michael. Thanks. So I think our panelists have. Um, painted a picture of uh, a fraught region with lots of potential pitfalls. Uh, but I also hear some broad agreement here that both uh, Russia and Turkey understand the uh, importance of de-escalating tensions um, and the hope that that, that will happen. I will have uh, sh three short questions for our panelists and, and short answers, please, so that we can uh, fit in a little bit of time from our audience. Um, but let me start with uh, Kemal. Um, mm. uh, Putin made an accusation um, that uh, Ankara was seeking to protect its oil exports uh, from ISIS. Um, and Erdogan has angrily refuted that and, in fact, called it slander. Um, but I wonder if you could tell us just briefly, what, in fact, are Turkey's interests in Syria, and what are they trying to protect there? I know that's a big question, but try to mm. give a short answer. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that Turkey has currently much of an economic interest in, uh, in Syria. And uh, the oil export, ISIS's oil export issue, I know has been a hot potato. It's been uh, in the last week or so extensively discussed. But from uh, what I hear from statements coming from the uh, tre Treasury, US Treasury, that this oil trade is mostly directed oddly and ironically to the Assad uh, regime, and some of it makes it through to Turkey. But you have to appreciate that what makes it to Turkey, I don't think involves in any way the state or the president himself. Uh, this is Adam Smith's laissez-faire hand working. Turkey has the highest uh, priced gas in, in the world. You buy a gallon of gas for two dollars in Turkey people buy a liter of gas for two dollars so inevitably oil finds its way into Turkey which was always the case I think what has led to the slander uh, put in slander is that and people can question what I'm going to say whether ethically etc is appropriate or not Oil that is being exported from the KRG, the Kurdish regional government's oil, being exported through trucks in Turkey is done by a company that his son 
uh, uh, owns. You can question that, but that doesn't mean that that company is actually involved in shipping uh, ISIS oil from Syria into, into Turkey. I have seen reports that some of that oil finds its way into uh, the Kurdish part of uh, Iraq and then from there to uh, 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 Turkey as well. What this captures is the murky nature of a war economy out there. The, the more delicate issue, and I, I won't go too much into the details of it, is that Turkey willingly or unwillingly is not fully controlling a stretch of the Turkish syrian border. I'm sure you've seen references to it, about 60 miles, and uh, uh, the world, the world, the Western world, including Russia, is ganging up on Turkey. There is massive pressure on Turkey. And last week, there was a Turkish official from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who was in town to try to persuade the town that Turkey, through statistics and photographs and all that, that Turkey is trying to seal that uh, border. Okay, thank you. And um, Maria, also on uh, Syria, uh, President Obama said recently about the coalition in Syria that, quote, we all have a common enemy and that is ISIL uh, or ISIS. Um, but in fact, uh, according to a recent Reuters analysis, uh, more than 80% of Russian attacks have bombed non-ISIS targets. Uh, Russia has clearly said that they uh, support the regime in Syria. Uh, Turkey, of course, uh, wants to uh, uh, Assad to go. Um, so is it possible to um, reconcile these very significant differences? Uh, yes, uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, it would be very hard to do that. And it would be also helpful that if the Obama administration and the President Obama understands that. Uh, because Russia has really, indeed, very different goals in Syria, unlike many other countries. It has been uh, uh, directing major uh, bombings uh, in, on the Syrian territory, have been directed against the so-called moderate opposition, uh, while the ISIS, in fact, only got 8% of the attacks. So even though uh, the stated uh, Russia's goals are to support uh, the um, uh, to, to, to fight against ISIS, and th those status goals have been supported repeatedly by the Western countries. In fact, the C we see that is not, uh, uh, it, is not, it is not what actually hap is happening. And I would really caution you from believing too much uh, into what uh, Russia has been saying, because Russia and its current leadership are also quite known uh, for, like, basically trying to engage in relations with the West up until a certain point and that uh, basically back down or do something against that. So Russia is not really a reliable uh, geopolitical partner. It, ha it has been shown for a while. Uh, also an important uh, negative influence that Russia has been actually imposing in Syria, whether purposefully or not is a different question, is actually radicalizing the few, very few remaining so-called moderate opposition forces that are still there. Because Russia's continuous bombings have been actually forces, forcing a lot of the uh, moderates into the ISIS or other radicalized groups. And uh, in a way, we have the situation in which Russia, again, creating this, you know, uh, analogous, anal basically something similar to a gas paddle in which it has this leverage over this big conflict. And when it is a certain kind of, uh, when it has certain goal, state, uh, goal in mind, it would push this paddle in order to achieve whatever it wants. We, so it's actually quite a similar strategy uh, that it has, as the one it has been trying to implement in Ukraine, again. Whether successful or not, it's a different question. Here again, we see that it's kind of, it's creating, uh, in Syria where the situation was, has already bad enough, Russia, by radicalizing those remaining elements, is creating this bomb ready to explode. But the Russia is the one who is uh, keeping the control out of this bomb, right? And if it wants some certain kind of, uh, certain kind of, uh, if it has certain kind of objective, it will ha kind of give this bomb to explode partly. This is what it looks like right now, and of course it's not something that the West would want. Uh, that's not the resolution of the conflict that the West would have in mind. Okay, thank you. 
And, and Michael, is it possible that there is a silver lining uh, to the Russia-Turkey tensions in terms of raising the stakes for solving the Nagorno-Karabakh crisis once and for all? Is it possible that this could lead to uh, a revival of the Minsk process and perhaps more serious attention um, from, from the powers? I mean, I like your optimism. Um, <laughs> Trying to end on a positive <laughs> note here. Uh, I, I suppose that um, in terms of Nagorno-Karabakh, there is, there is the possibility of an opportunity in, in the way the pieces are configured right now. Um, Azerbaijan being torn between Russia and Turkey um, has is is kind of caught in between, uh, caught in the middle of this conflict, and so has uh, certainly has more of an interest than it has, I I would say, um, in recent memory, uh, to see at least some kind of um, to have greater pressure put on on uh, on the players to to see some sort of a resolution to the conflict. Uh, it certainly does not want to be put in a position where. Its uh, its defensive relationship with Turkey is called into question in the event of a of a the outbreak of um, of large scale hostilities with Armenia, um, and I think the its current its current relationship with Moscow and its current dependence in many respects, at least diplomatically, um, and, and and in certain other ways militarily on Russia, um, also is also kind of put front and center by this. Uh, by this current uh, Russia-Turkey conflict. So there is, I think, there's the, the opportunity here is that there's more of an incentive for Baku to um, come to the bargaining table mm -hmm. than I think it has before. One of, the, one of the other silver linings, this isn't related to Karabakh necessarily, um, and this is something that Kamal and I were speaking about a little bit uh, before the, the event, is uh, the possibility that Turkey is going to really it's going to see a revitalization in its uh, turn towards the West. Kamal spoke to this a little bit uh, a moment ago, but um, I would say that it, certainly in Georgia, um, and, it's, and probably true for the wider Caucasus as well to an extent, um, Turkey has been much more engaged since Russia started bombing Sir, uh, Syria. Um, it seems to have been much more engaged in terms of advocating for Georgian entry uh, into NATO. Now, whether or not it's going to move, you know, move the needle um, in terms of in internal NATO politics is another question. I think that's one that's much harder to, to see happening. But it, it certainly um, creates a firmer bond between Turkey uh, and a country like, uh, like Georgia and may push Turkey to assume more responsibilities in the region. It has traditionally been uh, generally content to uh, be the, the, econo the merchant hegemon, um, as I've heard others put it. Um, in the region and uh, sort of let economics uh, take hold and um, sort of rise to the top uh, you know, by, by virtue of its, of its proximity rather than um, concerted engagement. But I think that uh, with the development of key, uh, key economic infrastructure and um, just the realization that it cannot, uh, that relations with Russia are no longer business as usual, uh, Turkey may be inclined to take a more active active role in the region, which could uh, help potentially resolve conflicts or at least provide, uh, provide ways to see uh, some de-escalation in certain respects. Okay. Well, thank you for being somewhat optimistic. <laughs> uh, so we began a little late. Uh, so with our organizers' um, approval, we'll just go a few minutes over to, so we can get a couple questions. We'll take some quick questions. Um, let us start right here in the front. Yes. Just, just tell us who on. you are, please. Hi, uh, Peter Humphrey, intelligence analyst and former diplomat. Um, Ms. Negovaya, that was a very brave analysis, and I'm wondering if you might have to defect uh, after today's presentation. Um, is it possible that uh, Russian mothers and wives are going to be upset at the continuing stream of bodies coming back from Donbass and Luhansk? That's what we hear, and I got to move on and say, what happens when we have more Russian bodies coming back from uh, Turkish bullets or Turkmen bullets? Um, at some point, isn't there a feedback loop where Russian mothers and wives start marching in uh, Red Square and, uh, and there's an, a genuine threat to Putin because Russians are standing up and saying, what, we're defending this idiot in Syria? Are you out of your mind? So thank you. So Maria, just to get in the interest of time, if you mm -hmm. could limit your remarks to the, um, the Middle Eastern part. 
Yeah, uh, so um, it's a great question, thank you very much. But unfortunately, as we've seen, Russian people have a lot of stamina, mm. much more than you'd want them to have, you know, given this situation. It is true that given its memories of Afghanistan, in Russia, the uh, attitudes toward the, uh, you know, going on the ground in Syria is quite, uh, quite cautious, even despite all the propaganda that you have. So uh, usually every uh, military escalation of Russia starts with Russians, you know, being kind of uh, wishy-washy about the engagement, but then as the broadcast <laughs> coverage becomes more and more aggressive, Russians kind of switch, uh, usually switch into supporting uh, whatever actions uh, Russia has been, uh, the Putin has implemented in that in, an, in yet another country. And that's what we have been observing uh, with Syria as well. Importantly though, it's not exactly a mobilizing factor, meaning that they're not ready to die for that, but they're, they are supporting that, right? And they're not being ready to die for that is an important kind of limitation. So what we saw on the Ukrainian uh, polls, for example, is that when asked, well, do you support the uh, Ukrainian uh, campaign, the majority would normally say yes, but when asked, uh, are you ready to send your sons to die there, they would say no. But at the moment, still, we see that the threshold for the larger scale protest has definitely not been reached yet. So even though they are reluctant regarding uh, the underground uh, military operation in Syria, and by the way, Putin has been careful about that as well. So, so far, the underground operation has been implemented by the majority Iran forces rather than uh, Russian forces per se. So it is not clear, Putin is smart enough to understand that as the danger. And, uh, and having uh, basically taken everything else in, uh, into account, Russian people at the moment are ready to basically, uh, you know, to sacrifice yet a lot of other things for the greatness of Russia as it's been, as it's been popularized on the state TV channel. So if the moment when the larger scale protest uh, will begin, will come at a certain point. It definitely not, will not come anytime soon, unfortunately. Thank you. And here, this gentleman here. Uh, David Fishman. A uh, question for Kemo Karisi. Uh, on Turkey domestically, uh, before this uh, plane incident, well, it's obviously a lose-lose situation economically and in perhaps in other ways for both Turkey and Russia. Uh, but domestically within Turkey, before this situation evolved, Turkey was a quite bitterly divided society. They just had an election where uh, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan uh, fell short of a constitutional majority, although he did better than expected in getting back in. Uh, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of political violence and journalistic repression and all the rest of it. What's your sense of how the Turkish uh, electorate is reacting to this outbreak of tensions with the Russians? In other words, there are trade interests, there are tourism interests, there are many other interests. There are people whose views of Erdogan are quite similar to people's views of Obama here, or Trump here, you know, it depends on which side of the spectrum you're on. So how do you see that playing out with respect to, uh, is Erdogan stronger because of this conflict with Russia? Is he weaker? Is it still up in the air? Does it depend how it goes? Thank you. So political implications. Uh, we don't yet have any public opinion surveys that capture, uh, that would provide us with some information to respond to your uh, very good question uh, there. However, there were earlier, uh, earlier surveys that asked the Turkish public opinion on Syria. And the Turkish public opinion on Syria is solidly against Turkish involvement uh, there. There is also in the Turkish public deep discomfort with ISIS and a feeling, a sense, which is part of the division, polarization that you've made uh, references to in, in Turkey, that Turkey, the government is not doing enough uh, to fight off the uh, ISIS uh, threat to Turkish uh, security. Uh, now, it's my subjective opinion that uh, the Turkish president and the government has not responded to Putin's, let's say, aggressive uh, language towards Turkey as one would have expected. And I've also noticed that in the last two, three weeks, the president has given up on its foul language towards the West. How does one explain that? I think one explains that he is, and the government is concerned about the economic consequences of uh, where this conflict could take the Turkish economy to. 
And it's also coming at a time when Turkey has struck a deal with the European Union where it is supposed to look into opening the Turkish employment market to Syrian refugees. The timing of this cri crisis in that sense could have not come at a worse, uh, at a worse uh, time. And this is why I am arguing that here there is a possibility, an opportunity for Turkish and Western interests to start to converge and see a Turkey that is much more willing to reinvigorate its relationship with especially the European Union. That, in turn, some of us believe, rightly, wrongly, and it, there may be a lot of wishful thinking there, too, it may also benefit Turkish domestic politics in terms of uh, reforms and improving the performance of the government on mm -hmm. issues that you've uh, raised. Thank you. We can hope. Um, yes, on with the beard there, yeah. Plaid shirt. Hi, my name is Joel Wasserman. I'm from right over at American Enterprise. Um, so looking at the Gordon of Karbach, um, uh, I guess a lot of folks in the American foreign policy commentary community have talked about how it's one of those, you know, post-Soviet frozen conflict zones. Obviously, it has um, much different roots from the conflict in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, but um, is it similar in the capacity that Russia maybe controls the levers of, uh, of force? Does Russia have the capacity, whether through their intelligence services, whether through organized crime or whatever, to, if, say, um, serious tensions were, uh, were re-emerging over the Gordon of Karabakh, to, I guess, pull the strings and um, pull um, Armenia and, to some extent, Azerbaijan back into uh, uh, a more peaceful disposition? Uh, disposition. Thank you. So uh, I mean, that's a good question. Excuse me, that's a good question. Um, I would say that Russia has the, has, there certainly has the mechanisms to influence events on the ground. Uh, not so much in a direct way as it does in uh, the Donbass or in Abkhazia or South Ossetia, um, but it certainly has relationships um, within uh, the Armenian government and within the Azerbaijani government in which it can either press for or uh, reject or sometimes even, as I've been told, veto certain things um, that, that may affect uh, events along, uh, along the, um, the line of control there. So it certainly does have a role that it can play, but it's not, it's not one where uh, Russia can necessarily um, push a button and things will happen. I mean, just the other day we had uh, some, uh, there was violation, uh, airspace violation in Georgia coming over from uh, Russian-controlled territories. And, it, and it's not really quite the same um, in Nagorno-Karabakh, just by virtue of the fact that Russia is, uh, although it's certainly involved um, by, uh, by its relationships locally, it's not a, um, a, pr a principle in the conflict. Uh, whether or not it can affect uh, change, I think, is certainly true. Um, it can certainly facilitate peacemaking, um, but it can also play a longer game. And I think this is one of the, the concerns that I've heard uh, from both Armenians and Azerbaijanis in that uh, Russia has uh, sort of manipulated its, its, uh, its relationships on both sides to, to not resolve the conflict, but to actually keep it going to some extent um, because it, it maximizes its, re its, uh, its relationships in both Baku and uh, Yerevan by ensuring that there are tensions between the two states. Um, I mean, Russia sells a lot of arms to both countries. Uh, there's even, I've even heard someone uh, give me uh, their view that uh, it, it, Russia, or actually Armenia, sorry, Azerbaijan may actually be subsidizing Armenian purchases of Russian mm -hmm. weaponry because uh, they, they buy Russian weaponry at cost, whereas Armenia gets, uh, usually gets subsidies. Um, so, but there's certainly a Russian uh, interest in, in selling that weaponry to both sides um, and ensuring that they have a certain amount of uh, 
certain amount of pliability among the actors in, in Baku and Yerevan. And I think and I th and it's not as though people in, in Armenia and Azerbaijan are not aware of this. They, they realize that, but they also realize that uh, Russia is the, you know, is the traditional power, is the strong one, and the one with uh, a lot of the levers, and so they, you know, they kind of have to play the game. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid we've reached the end of our time. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. And I believe our panelists are still here for a couple minutes, if you'd like to approach them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good to meet you. Mm. Thank you.